Jeremiah chapter 9. And uh, I've been endeavoring over the past uh, several months to preach from the Scripture, encouraging practical messages. There are so many uh, truths that just have to do with the Christian life or our attitude or our faith that when you comprehend the truth, they're really breakthroughs, they're, they're steps, and uh, they, are, they are opportunities for us to either overcome things that would hinder us from being useful for serving the Lord Jesus, or they are things that just help our eyes to be open to who God is. And so, and so my phone's ringing, I just turned it on silence, and I should probably answer it, but... Do you know who would call a pastor during service time? Hey, Tashi. See you, buddy. Um, it's easy to tell uh, people that are trying to call a church. <laughs> so, uh, Jeremiah chapter 9. So I was saying that the truths, foundational truths, actually help you as a, as a Christian. There are just some things that you learn that when you grasp them, they either give you a picture of God and who He is and help you in your relationship with Him, or else those same truths uh, help you just to have a perspective on life to where you understand what God's doing and the attitude you need to have. And so this evening in Jeremiah chapter 9, I want to look at something uh, simply simple and something that actually is quoted in the New Testament. And uh, this is just a simple truth about how we're to view ourselves. And Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. You see it? Let's pray and then we'll unpack it a little bit and then we'll fellowship and go home. Father, thanks so much. Thanks for the insight into what You are pleased by and what is man's obligation to deliver to You with regard to the spirit or the attitude that we have. Please help us this evening as we not only understand the Scripture, help us to know how we can apply it practically. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. It ought to occur to us pretty shortly after we really recognize who we are in Jesus, that we do not belong to ourselves, we are not our own. It also ought to occur with us that the things we can be proud of, we can't take credit for. And the things that perhaps we have no say in, we have no right to be ashamed for. I don't know about you, but I admire talent, don't you? I admire skill. I admire cleverness and wisdom. This, uh, I, I like things that people do that just show that they possess not only intelligence of human nature, but, but in life. Uh, Melissa's boss this past week was telling a story about an owner of a car dealership in Fort Lauderdale and uh, how the family kind of got started in that business. The man uh, went to a car dealership, one of the few car dealerships, went in Fort Lauderdale, it's a fairly young city, and he applied for a position. And they told him, no, they weren't interested in hiring him. And so he had printed like thousands of cards with his name on the card. And he went and distributed them all over town. And on Monday, when they opened up, everybody was calling and asking for him. Asking, hey, is so-and-so there? And so they called and hired him. They said, well, if we're getting this many leads, this many calls, this guy's serious about selling cars. And uh, he ended up being, of course, very successful and very wealthy. And I thought... I like this story. I thought, well, that's clever. You know, you don't want to hire me. I don't want to work for you. But this man wanted the job. 
And he was going to show them one way or another that the intelligent decision was to hire him. That's wise, wasn't it? A lot of wisdom in that. I don't know how many of y'all would have thought of that, but I admire that kind of thinking and that sort of ingenuity. You know, guy wants a job, they won't give him a job, and so he starts working for him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, a, that's, a pretty, that's pretty smart. I think I admire that. It's wisdom, I would say. It's practice knowledge, but it's knowledge put into practice. He understood human nature, understood the things that appeal to people trying to do sales, and, and he did something and is very successful as a result of it. I admire that. Okay. I admire strength. I respect strength. I admire strength. Most people respect and admire strength, right? I mean, I like I some of the people in my youth that impressed me the most were the strongest people. There's a, several people who used to work for my dad that were incredibly strong. One guy uh, used to uh, be an inmate in Arkansas. He was in the Arkansas prison, and back then they had chain gangs on the highways, and they actually had the guys break up rock with sledgehammers. And so my dad had this guy that worked for him uh, that, you know, he had some pretty big guns. He, he swung sledgehammers for several years, and he was incredibly strong. Uh, one time, when there was going to be a hailstorm, and my dad had a used car dealership, and so they were trying to put as many cars as they possibly could in the garage. And so the guy picked cars up and turned them, turned them on in. And then he went somewhere, and we had to wait for him to come back before we could get the cars back out because uh, he was such a strong guy. Another guy, uh, I could tell stories all day long about people I grew up around, but we were car crushing out in, uh, let's see, northwestern, southwestern Nebraska. And we crushed for these farmers. They had a whole bunch of cars on their farm, and they were, they were characters. Most people out in Kansas and Nebraska are, generally speaking, pretty much characters. And we were crushing for these guys. I can't remember, the, I think it was Pat and Phil. The last name was Zach. And Pat Zach was about uh, six foot seven. He was an above average guy. But he was not just six foot seven. He was six foot seven and like just a monster. Just ripped. Big guy. And he could pick up the back end of a Chevy Caprice. Like, a, you know, in a 1970s Chevy Caprice. Not this late 78 box Chevy Caprice, like the heavy, like 73, 74 or the Impala, I should say. He could pick up a back of an Impala. Just, hey, guy, hey boys, watch this. He would show me my brother. His younger brother, uh, I think his name was Phil, if I remember correctly, who was my size, my height, uh, when my brother and I were teenagers, picked both of us up and said, you guys met? You know, did that thing on us, you know? Like, ching! Y'all know my brother, right? And, uh, you know, I was very light when I was a teenager, but still... I mean, he was only six foot, just a, just a freakishly strong guy. I admire that. I respect strength. You know, I've met some strong people, some big people. I used to work with a guy in the mechanic shop, and uh, he, was a, he was a power lifter. And at the time that he worked there, he was in his early 30s, and he was at that time bench pressing 575. If you know lifting... Used to be, years ago, 500 was like, you know, nobody could get over 500. And so 575 was pretty, pretty solid. I can't remember what he could squat, but it was, it, was, it was a lot. And my friend and I used to be able to stand shoulder to shoulder on the back of him, and he was the same width, same height as me, but he was the same width as my friend and I, shoulder to shoulder. His forearms were 18 inches. He used to always say to me, I hated it being phrased this way, but he would say, hey, Ryan, can you come over and reach down in here? I, you got little bitty arms. I can't, I can't reach in the spot. No man ever wants to be told that he has little bitty arms. He has little bitty arms, you know. But you got little bitty arms, you know, reach down in here or whatever. And, uh, and so and there's another guy, and he was probably, oh, I don't know, about five foot eight that I worked with, and he was the state and regional arm wrestling champion. Uh, he was state and regional arm wrestling champion. Never knew they had such a thing, but he had all these trophies there. And uh, we used to arm wrestle for fun. At, uh, you know, and he would take on like three of us. And he was like half my size, a small guy. I admire strength in a big dude. I admire strength in a small dude. I just think, you know, you admire strength. Um, I've met uh, some wise people. I've met some strong people. And I, I'm impressed by it. I've met some mighty people. 
I think mighty people would be um, individuals that have great power. Oftentimes, I think that would be in a political realm, um, for good or for bad. People that are accomplished, maybe, uh, maybe they're mighty financially, or they're mighty uh, as far as their influence goes. Rocket belly, or rocket man. Rocket man cracks me up. Does he crack you up? He's just such a diminutive little chubby fellow, the North Korean despot. And uh, <laughs> I like calling him Rocket Man. That's a great title, Rocket Boy, Rocket Man. Anyway, uh, he's mighty. Honestly, he, he, people are just terrorized by him. They're terrified of him. You speak with North Korean people that have escaped that despot. And you ask him, why doesn't somebody do something about him? Everyone in his country fears him and hates him. But he's mighty. I mean, he's strong. Like, you know, he, he kills so many people that every time an attempt's been made on his life or to overthrow him, he just murders anyone who opposes him. And he's there, they just say he can't be overthrown. He just can, will kill, he'll have anyone killed. Fidel Castro, very similar circumstances. You know, Fidel Castro, if you uh, don't just read the political aspect of things, but you just look at what he did to his country and to his people. And you ever speak to a Cuban, they hate him. They just hate the guy. Why doesn't somebody do something about him? They say he's just too powerful. The people nearest to him are afraid of him and the people further away from him, he's mighty. And I, don't, I won't say that evil in might I admire, but I admire somebody who's powerful. Everybody kind of does to some degree, don't we? One of the things that the Bible says gives us perspective about strength, about wisdom, about might, is that nobody has it. No one has it because they came up with it. You know, one of the things about those two brothers that were so strong that always got me was you'd ask them, do you lift weights? No, not really. Uh, the power lifter guy, he lifted weights. But you ask him, where'd you get your strength? He said, my little brother's stronger than me, and he hardly lifts at all. It just, it's just genetics. We're just, we're just strong in our family. You wonder about the guy that was clever enough to print business cards for a company that wouldn't hire him and distribute them. Where'd he come up with that? Well, as far as I know, he thought of it. Where did he come up with a mind like that? A way it just understands human nature and understands how to respond in a situation like that. How did a guy get to be so smart? Well, he didn't. God made him that way. He was just born that way. Uh, riches. You know, you can talk to some people uh, that have become rich. You can talk to some people that have become powerful. Most of the time they'll inform you how they did it. But you know, other people do a lot of the same things and don't have the same results. There are some very intelligent people who have made very, very good decisions and they don't become crazy wealthy. Timing just has a lot to do with a lot of things, doesn't it? Just the timing of it. The same with power. I mean, there's just sometimes the times are right for things. How does a person become powerful or, or wealthy? Well, God made them that way. He gave them that. Christian, one of the things that is so... Hey, Jonathan, you see those people back there? I'm here. Look at me, okay? All right. Don't do that? Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Uh, one of the things that we as Christians need to be mindful about is that we don't have anything God didn't give us. And so, Jeremiah gives this message from God in the middle of a passage of Scripture that's all about destruction and all about uh, God's people being destroyed because of disobedience. And he's answering the question, what does God want? You know, sometimes we think God needs our intelligence. Sometimes we think God needs our strength or God needs our wealth or God could tap into some of our power and we could advance the cause. The reality of it is God's not interested in any of that. Verse 24, the Bible says, Let him that glorieth, glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that 
I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness. What's a wonderful thing when a guy is ex exceptionally clever, but he realizes that um, God's thoughts are higher than his. And that everything that he does because of his intelligence is only because God made him that way. God just gave me the ability to think. He gave me the ability to reason. gave me wit. gave me circumstances to develop that. You know, if God gave me half a mind or no mind, it'd be God that gave it to me. So, God's the one. The, the, the rich man, God gave it to me. And so what we see here is that we as believers are to realize regardless of what they are. Let me just say this. You're likely to some degree to be one of these. One of these things are likely to be one of your great strengths. You may be exceptionally wise. I wish we had some more wealthy people. I'd like to be your friends. <laughs> you know, you may be a person that, I mean, God gives you great wealth. Uh, you may be, I'm joking about that wealth thing. I probably shouldn't joke about things like that. You might take me seriously. Uh, you're lucky you know me at least. The, uh, you might be a person that has talent. It might be one of those things. But Christian, God made it, made you that. That's what God made you to be. And if you think you can glory in those things, you're forgetting who God is. Let Him glory in this. And then notice this, that He understandeth and knoweth me. If you listen to the average Christian contemporary song, you come to the realization that most people don't understand God. They just develop a concept of God. I'm serious about this. Uh, I don't listen to contemporary music. I just don't like it. Uh, I'm not talking about recent music. I mean the, the genre of uh, pop, Christian pop music. I was talking this morning, I was just using for an illustration, I, uh, the song, I Can Only Imagine. And this, it, it's not as popular as it was a few years ago, but we were, we were referencing the Scripture that says, I have not seen, nor hath ear, nor ear heard, neither hath entered in the heart of man the things which God hath promised for them that love Him. The song I can only imagine imagines what heaven's like. And yet the Scripture says we can't imagine it. It says we've never seen anything that will relate to it. We've never heard anything that relates to it. And uh, our hearts have never... I imagine anything like heaven. And you got a whole song where a guy, you know, or people are talking about what they imagine heaven's like. I'm sorry, they're just wrong about it. You know, you can't relate to heaven. It's too far beyond us. It's too much for us. And oftentimes, we as Christians are far more guilty of imagining who God is than we are of finding out who God is. How do you know who God is? Does anybody know how to know who God is? His Word. What? What? His Word. His Word. What He says, how He reveals Himself. Most people know more about what they think about God than they know about what God says about Himself. And so we hear these kind of things sometimes. You ever heard someone say this? Well, my God wouldn't. Or, my God, and you can't tell them anything from the Word of God that contradicts what they believe about their God. My God, it's great that you've personalized your God. That you feel like God is your God. But oftentimes it's more of a the God which I have built in my imagination than the God which I have found in His Word. You want glory in something, Glory in what you have come to understand about who God is. If you want to come to that place, my friend, first you've got to go to the place where God tells us who He is. So many times we know so much less about God because of what we think than what we've learned from His Word. You want to glory in something. Glory in who God is because of what you've come to understand about Him. Glory in, wow, this is true about God. I'm going to tell you something. You learn things about God, you won't be amazed by man. You won't be amazed by what man can do, and you won't be amazed by what you can do. Then the Bible says, Knoweth me. 
If you don't understand who God is, don't kid yourself that you know Him. Right? Someone tells me, I remember this guy when I was in, when I was in college telling me this. this. This stuck with me for quite a while, this illustration he used. We were discussing uh, charismatic, uh, charismatic doctrine, speaking in tongues, and so forth. And we were, I was trying to look at it from the Bible, and he, t we, we, he just didn't want to talk about what the Bible said very much. So we were looking at 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14. We looked at it, and he said, well, let me just explain it to you this way. And right when he started off on it, I thought, well, let's just not, I'm not going to be able to relate to this very well. He said, God is like an elephant. How many of you all ever heard God's like an elephant illustration? You have? You've heard it? I've heard it a few times. An elephant's really big. I think, okay, God's really big. You know, elephant's really big. But God's so much bigger than an elephant. You know, I mean, I can't really relate to God when he's talking about a little thing. It's just a created thing that God's man. Why not? Why not a whale? You know, I mean, you know, at least or a Loch Ness monster or something. I don't know. God's like an elephant. You know, you can be blind. He said, "We're all like blind men. We're just groping around trying to find God." And one blind man is toward the back of the elephant, and he gets a hold of the tuft on his tail. And to him, God feels like the tuft of a tail of an elephant. And he said, another guy, he's toward the front. He's got a hold of the trunk and it feels strong and flexible. And God's strong and flexible. And another guy's got a hold of the tusk. And it's just smooth and, and uh, hard, you know, and that's the way God is. And another guy's got a hold of the ear. And, uh, you know, it's kind of waving and flapping. And that's the way God is. And he described all the parts of an elephant. And when he got done, I said, you know, I only got one problem with that. And he said, what? I said, well, God's not an elephant. I was going to develop a theology of God on the basis of the anatomy of an elephant. You'd be better off developing a theology of God by writing everything the Bible says about Him. Every time you read God describing Himself, write that down. And you have a pretty good understanding of who God is. Is God multidimensional? I mean, can God be a God of wrath and a God of judgment and also a God of grace and mercy? Yeah. You know what? If you, if, if you need God's wrath and judgment, you'll know Him that way. If you need God's grace and mercy, you'll know Him that way. If you're willing to receive it. See? Is God multidimensional? Yes. How do we know who God is? We understand Him, and when we understand Him, then we apply our understanding of God, and then we know Him. I tell you, if you ever get to know God, you won't be impressed by anything else. If you understand God, I promise you, you'll be impressed. If you know God, nothing else will impress you. That's what the Scripture is saying. It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's not a real complex truth, but it's a real help. Uh, he said, here are some things that you'll understand. I am the Lord, notice this, which exercise loving kindness. That's a unique word, actually, used to characterize or describe only God. Loving kindness. Kindness. It's kindness with a personal touch. It's not just kindness, but a kindness which is demonstrated, which demonstrates, I love you. Loving kindness. The Psalms, the psalmist David, in one of his psalms, called it, I believe this would be an illustration of it, when he asked God for a token for good. God, do something in my life that just shows me that you love me. Token for good. I had a pastor friend that preached a message on that one time. And uh, as silly as it was, he said, y'all are going to think this is silly. And he's a tall guy, uh, about 6'4 or so, and real gangly. And in his 30s, because of health issues, he was deciding to get in shape. And so he had a guy in his church teaching him how to play basketball. And he said he was just especially down. He just really needed to feel God's love one morning. And he said, God, give me a token for good. And he said, help me make some three-pointers. And he said, in a game, he shot four threes. Made all four of them. And he said, now guys, you don't put, you don't, I'm not telling you to test God and all these things. He says, but you know what? He said, I know that God helped me make four three-pointers without missing one as a token for good. Just, just, God, just God saying, you know, I'm involved in your life and, 
If you'd like a couple of stupid baskets, I'll give them to you. Because I love you. Token. Loving kindness. God's like that. Not only is He loving, but He wants you to know His love. It's, 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 it's very, very uh, beneficial. Uh, I'm about to make up a word. I'm not going to do that. It wouldn't have been as good a word as I wanted. <laughs> God's very, very gracious too. He's loving. He's loving kindness. You get to know God, you'll kind of know. Have you ever met somebody that said this before? I don't ask God for things. Have you ever met the I don't ask God for things person? You know, I mean, I've got everything I need. I don't ask God for things. God's got plenty to do. He doesn't need me asking for stupid things. I don't need anything from God. You know, I like to ask God for stupid things. Just because I get to experience His loving kindness, that's an attribute of God. I'm serious. I'll pray and ask for God's will and stupid things. I don't say, God, should I brush my teeth? Of course you shouldn't brush your teeth. You don't have time for that. <laughs> or, but, you know, I, I mean, I don't ask God about what I should do for silly things. But I'll tell you something. I ask God for just stuff all the time. Can't find my keys. God, would you help me find my keys? I, I can't remember something. God, would you help me remember? God, I mean, just, just silly stuff. And when God does it, I know He did it. And it is a reminder of His loving kindness. That is, I'm very small, I'm very finite, I'm very, in comparison with God, insignificant. In comparison with the universe, I'm insignificant, but I'm telling you, in comparison with God, I am literally nothing. And yet I can ask God for just little petty things to me and experience His loving kindness. God, would you help me just to be able to get through these traffic lights? So I try it sometime. Boy, I really see it all the time. <laughs> I mean, just just things, you know? Just stuff that just, God, you know, I just say, I just don't fill up to whatever. And just ask God. Loving kindness. I tell you, you get to know the loving kindness of God, you glory in it. Judgment. Judgment. Does anyone remember last fall when we were actually preaching through this book? The two things that God wanted from Israel. What are the two things that God wanted from Israel? Judgment. Yeah. Right? Judgment is one of them. What is the other? Righteousness. Righteousness. Righteousness and judgment from His people. You, know, you could diagnose Israel's problem. You could say they did this and this and this and this and this and this. But actually what they didn't care about was justice. Judgment care about God's righteousness. When you get to understand judgment, you'll understand the importance of it. Uh, let me help you with something. Both of these things that we're talking about are actually issues that because we're not spiritual enough to let the Spirit of God deal with us, these are self-esteem issues. If you have, are struggling with your self-esteem, both of these issues will have to do with your self-esteem. You don't think God cares about you or you think that people don't care about you enough. Your self-esteem will be fine when you experience God's loving kindness. You don't think you matter. You don't think you're important. And God shows you that you matter to Him. It will put in perspective whatever you, your perception of what other people think about you. It will. It'll just When you realize how much God esteems you, nothing else will matter. No one else's esteem will matter. It will help you with it. Judgment. Because of injustice, many, many believers are frustrated about life. I'm telling you, injustice. You say, well, you know what? Life's not fair. We know life's not fair. But injustice will mar people for life. Do you know what the source is? of the perversion issue is today? You know what the source of it is? I mean, the cause of the perversion issue today? I understand there's an agenda and so forth. But this whole matter of people not being able, not knowing, being confused, if you will, about their gender and so forth, you know what the source of it is? Abuse. It's abuse. It's physical abuse. And it's people who have been abused who have never found justice. They've never found judgment against the evil. Or it's people that have done evil and never been judged and they're frustrated personally. I don't want to get into details particularly because of the crowd we have this evening. 
I'm going to tell you something. Judgment is much needed. The best thing, one of the best things you can do to help somebody who is struggling with esteem because of abuse is to seek out judgment. To seek judgment. To demand judgment. To expose evil and to seek to have God's plan for judgment done. Whether that's legal, whether it's spiritual, but our need, our need and our esteem issue with judgment is, is to see that there is judgment. That evil is not left unpunished. You know how many people are angry with God because of evil that they think God is unconcerned with? <clears throat> you get to know God, my friend, you'll get to understand He's a God of judgment. You'll see, first of all, the first place where finally the things that are evil against you can be taken to and you can find peace and forgiveness and that's the cross. The cross is all about judgment, my friend. It's all about injustice. See, Jesus was God's perfect Son and He never sinned. And on that cross, Jesus was judged in our place for sin. And my friend, if there's a God that cares about judgment, it's a God who says all sin must be judged. And then turns around and judges His own Son. Judges Himself. And if you take the lack of judgment in your life to that cross, and you leave it there, and you allow it there to be compared with the injustice of a Savior who never sinned, dying for your sin, you'll leave that place having found judgment in the way that you need it. And you'll have experienced God in a way that will help you. You won't be struggling with your esteem or struggling with who am I and what's wrong with me and all these things because you'll know there's a God who judges. We need judgment. We need God's loving kindness. We need God's judgment. Righteousness. Again, in Jeremiah, if you were to study two words, judgment and righteousness, you'd find that these two words are the theme of Jeremiah. They're the theme of the entire book. Righteousness. Absence of sin, God's holy character, God's perfect person. And then you'll notice that the place that God executes those is in the earth. God exercises those things in the earth. In other words, these are not nebulous future concepts. These are in actuality the reality of the God that we know and that we serve today. Christian, if you could just comprehend these things, it would help you to overcome a lot of issues in your life. God is speaking to a people who are looking for wisdom, they're looking for might, they're looking for strength, they're looking for riches. If you were to know the context a little bit, you'd know that captivity is imminent because of God's people's rebellion against Him. And they're looking everywhere trying to avoid justice. Trying to avoid God's judgment. Primarily, they're looking to Egypt and they're trying to hire the Egyptians to protect them. They're looking around them trying to find allies. They're trying to find uh, ideas. Come up with wisdom. Ways that they could keep uh, that Assyrian army that's coming. And the way that they can keep Nebuchadnezzar who is, is uh, looming on the horizon from coming. Ways that they could stop the captivity from happening. What they actually needed was the captivity. They actually needed the judgment. This passage of Scripture is quoted in 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, in, in the first chapter. Will you go there with me real quickly? We'll conclude with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. This is when people become all about per personality and um, the gospel is described this way by Paul in verse 18 after talking about the division of the believers over the different personalities and the division in the church because people are following different individuals he said in verse 18 for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness but unto us which are saved is the power of God. 
Where is the wise? For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. This is, I don't want to preach this message this evening, but Christian, if you would understand that intellect isn't what causes people to turn to Jesus. You just understand that it's just the simple truth that the foolishness of God is wiser than men, the weakness of God is stronger than men. And you'd simply realize that God uses the foolishness of preaching. And uh, the foolish preacher that God uses is me. And the foolish preacher that God uses is you. And that's actually how God looks at you and looks at me as far as our ability. So many times we think, man, I need to be better at presenting the gospel. We'll be as good as you can be, humanly speaking. Man, I need to, I need to you know, come up with some convincing arguments for the really smart people to help them to understand, you know, and help them to understand that you don't have to be dumb to believe in Jesus. Friend, what you have to do is just be a foolish preacher. That's what the Bible says. God uses the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You say, Pastor, so only foolish people uh, preach the gospel or other foolish people are saved? Well, in comparison with God, yes. That's the only kind of people there actually are. Uh, there are people that think they're somewhat intellectual and they deny there's a God. And the Bible says about them, the fool has said in his heart, there's no, God. <laughs> no God, there's no God. So, yeah, that's about the only kind of people there are. I hate to break it to you in comparison with God. Well, you know, if I just was really powerful in my presentation, yeah, there aren't any powerful people actually in comparison with God. You're going to try to let yourself be an example of God's power, my friend. People will be so disappointed they won't believe. Foolishness of preaching. Fools preaching. You say, Pastor, I don't think it means it that way. Look at verse 23. Uh, we know that the Jews required a sign the Greeks seek after wisdom. Verse 23, we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews, a stumbling block unto the Greeks foolishness. The Jews want a supernatural sign and they don't want preaching. The Greeks want wisdom and they're not interested in your foolish uh, your foolish simplicity. But the Bible says, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Jump with me to 27. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not or nothing uh, to bring to not or nothing things that are. God just uses fools to literally bring the house down. I love the description in Acts of the apostles when they preached the gospel and they were described as individuals who have turned, remember this, the world upside down. These are the guys who turned the world upside down. Fools. Ignorant. Fishermen. Imbeciles. And everybody keeps following them. Everybody keeps turning to their Jesus. Why? Because as many people as receive the message, whether they're Jews or Greeks, Christ is the wisdom of God. Christ is the power of God. And when you know it, it's real. You can't describe that to a person who thinks they're so intelligent that there's no God. You can't describe that really to a person who thinks that they are so powerful that they don't need God. You can simply preach it, and as many as will receive it, my friend, they'll, have, they'll receive the power of to become the sons of God. And guess what? That intelligent guy will become one more fool preaching the Word of God. Say, Pastor, you know, you're supposed to build me up. I know, it's building up message, building up sermon. The um, Bible says in verse 29 that no flesh should glory in His presence. Third, verse 31, we see where, this, where the Apostle Paul is getting his text. That according as it is written, He that glorieth let him glory in the Lord. And so, 
Let's be careful about this matter of glory. Let's be careful that glory isn't directed usward or even outward on a human plane. Let's be careful that glory is directed upward to the Lord Jesus Christ who deserves all the glory. Let me ask you a question. Do you think it might be possible that God does not work as much as He would or could because of this glory matter, this glory issue? Sometimes I think God keeps us small so we stay small. You say it doesn't make much sense. Well, think it through a little bit. Sometimes I think God keeps us small so we stay small. Because if we were successful, humanly speaking, we'd think it's because we're strong or we're intelligent. And we're not. And so if we were to think that, we'd just be wrong. We'd be mistaken. And I believe that assigning glory or misdirecting glory to ourselves or others when it should be directed to God not only distracts us from knowing God as He is, but it also hinders us from seeing God and His wisdom and His ability. I have noticed that anything great God has ever used me to be involved in, I can't really take credit for. It's just because He's God. It's pretty neat to be able to know a God like that, isn't it? I think it would be perfectly appropriate for us to just be in awe, infatuated, overzealous for, overcome by God's wisdom and God's power so that God could have the glory that He deserves. He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. We could practically live that out this week, couldn't we? Let's give God the glory. Every Christian is created for that purpose. And if we do anything with what God has done, but that purpose, my friend, it will detract from, and it'll be something that's not impressive. I just like to see, I like to see the God, who is the God who's loving, kind, who's I'd like to see His loving kindness, I'd like to see His judgment, I'd like to see His ability. So let's give Him the glory He deserves, and we will. Father, thank you for the truth, for the nugget about this matter of glory. I pray that even with my feeble words and struggling to put together sentences, that God, the truth of it, would just stand out and the power of it would appeal to us. And we would see ourselves as we are and would see You as You are. And that You'd have the glory because of it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Thank mm -hmm. you.